So, Ray, tell us how you started at Bristol Cars. Tell us how you came to start at Bristol Cars. Well, when I got to Bristol Cars, I thought I was going to go into a, a superior job straight away, building engines, but that wasn't to be, really. I had to go through all the small parts, learn all about the intricacies of the small bits and pieces and all the sub-assemblies, mm. and that took about six months, and mostly on um, differentials, crown wheel and pinion, crown and planet wheels and all that sort of thing. Everything was done, blued, marked up, and had to be perfect. And in fact, even when they were put into the vehicle, they could come back three times before they'd accept it as a mm. winner. Mm. Dave, who used to be the test bloke, we used to hate to see him coming back because <laughs> he'd say, we are axle. And then that right. meant it'd strip out again. Right. So right. after that department, you know, I began to get the message that everything was you know, highly, you know, specialised at every every angle of it. And then they, I was transferred to the head department, which was um, what I wanted. And from then on, you know, I began to see that I was really into high-class manufacture. And I learned a lot. It, all through my life, I've used this, you know, high standard. And it's something that I don't think we're going to see very often, really. What year was this? Well, the years that I was there, I didn't... My stay was not a long one. It was about three years, actually. Mm. So I, I, I wouldn't probably have had a job there if it hadn't been for the, um, the, all the main builders going over to the laundry to form a racing team. I don't think there would have been a job for me other than that. And this was the, the whole reason they were taking on new people, was because probably about 10 of them, was, the staff was going over to form this team, you see. Mm. So I think that was my chance, you know, that was the highlight for me, you know, to get into the car department, you know. And I honestly believe that um, I never would have had a chance to get an aircraft because I hadn't got those skills, you know. Yes, you'd come from... Um from a motor engineering background? I, I had, I had really, and I, you know, a very good one really, because my, my father was a, an inspector at Villiers, and my granddad was an inspector at Herbert Austin's. So, um, you know, that was good, and my brother was a design draftsman, and uh, the other brother was also an inspector at Hobson's, and it was high class engineering. So I, I had a good background, but I did serve an apprenticeship for about six, seven years really. It was five years apprenticeship and then two years. And that was in Wales? That was in Wales. Then I went into the forces, into the RASC, as an ambulance driver, mechanic, you know. Mm. So when you came to Bristol Cars, how did the, what were the standards of inspection like compared to what you were used to? Well, it was unbelievable, really. I think it really shook me. I couldn't believe you know, what was going on, really, when everything you made was rejected, you know, when it mm. was perfectly all right, as far as I could see, you know. But every tooth and every gear was blued up in the gearbox, and I couldn't imagine that for a start off, you know. And everything was dressed with a fast gun and buffed up and all that. And when it came to the major stuff, like the cylinder heads, well, that was unbelievable. Everything was weighed and tested and... You know that was that was magic, really, and I mean I I couldn't uh, with the racing engines, for instance. I mean I always ground a valve in, and that the seating was there to be seen, fair enough. But that wasn't the end of it with them. You machined the valve then, right to the what do you call it? The the, the uh, the seat? The or? seat. Yes. Right to the seat, the back seat. And everything was done like that with precision. The springs were tested to uh, the tenacity and everything. You know, that it, it had to fly, really, you know, really. And that was before the build, you know. So, I mean, when I was transferred to the engine build, <laughs> I was well educated on what was going to be inside mm. there, you know, really. And I don't think, if, if I hadn't gone through those preliminary things, I don't think I could have done it, really. Yes. But I had the confidence by then 
you know, after seeing the heads, like a six port head and all the honing and, and everything that went into it for gas flow in and all that and testing all the s cylinders and every piston was checked for size A, B and C and, and all that sort of thing. I began to get the message and I enjoyed it really, I really did, I loved it in the end, you know, and I, I was so confident with it, it didn't uh, have a iota of worry, you know, really. And it was a joy to see an engine on the end of the line, waiting for the blokes to take it to test bed, you know, and then waiting for it to come back to see what the results so you, were. So you were working on the engine assembly line? I was the way through. How many of you were there on the engine assembly line? Well, at my time, there was a maximum of four. Right. And, that, and how, did you, how did you do the engines? How did you do the engines? Well, I mean, you, the whole kit came down into a rack. All the parts were put into a rack behind the assembly line. And every bolt, nut, screw was in that rack. Mm. Right, n never put out, it was there, you know. And then from there on, the block, the crankshaft, the camshaft, and everything, the bushes, was all yours. You did the lot. There was no question about somebody helping you halfway through. Mm. We had apprentices from time to time, from down the college, I had one, Terry Davis. I, he got to the stage where I allowed him to do some work, but not a lot, but we had these boys come along for training, for the practical stuff. And to this day, you know, we're still in contact. But the thing was, um, it was your baby all the way along the line. There was no question about this don't fit or that don't fit. If the crankshaft didn't fit, you made it fit, and that was it. You know, you put the weights on, you put everything. And you balanced it and you found out whether it was accurate or not. And if it, it needs straightening the crankshaft, you straightened it too. So you were responsible for an engine from start to finish? Absolutely, absolutely. On your own or did you work in pairs? No, on your own. Entirely on your own. And um, inspection was there, right in the middle. Um, often it was dual inspection. You know, it, for instance, they might s sign for something alternatively, but they would check others' inspection, each each one, and sign for it. Yes. You know? So it was doubly checked, really, you know. Even piston rings, right down to the last, you know. And if a piston ring was a few thou out, that was no good, that was out. You didn't get away with that one, you know. So, um, and how long would it take you to do an engine, to assemble an engine? Well, I think, I think really, the time allotted, I, I never really agreed with this, really, because it, I, I couldn't see that you could build an engine on a bonus system, but I think 32 hours was allowed for the engine build, yes. but you was expected to build the engine within, eight, within 18 hours to get the bonus, whatever it was, you know. Right. I right. never achieved that. I never, I never agreed with it, and I never tried to, to do oh, it. Oh. So I, I was always outside the limits, and they, they did chide me about it, but I used to say, well, you know, I felt that Th th that engine was my baby and it warranted that time, you know, and that was it. You might have been tied up with something, you know, uh, uh, assembly of a sump. Uh, they were difficult to assemble and, you know, it might take you a long time. And you had the inserts to put in the sump. Things didn't always go well, you know, and then all the blanks to put in the block. And, that, and, and then again, you might have to take the bushes out of the out of the block if, if the inspection didn't agree. If you uh, you got a two, two thou clearance and they wanted one and a half, out comes the bushes back again. So, I mean, time to me it shouldn't have been a factor, you know. Yeah. And uh, it didn't really worry me because I, I, I didn't, didn't try to, to do it. And so the inspectors were on the assembly line. All the time. And they were, they were checking and measuring Throughout the process, all the time. they check all the bores for piston size, and it might be A, B, or C. But you know that, that was what we was given. You fitted the pistons and um, con rods and all that, and yeah. everything was done on the bench behind the assembly line. You you, you assemble things there, but it was your baby by the way through. You know what open. was the difference between A, B, and C for piston well, size? Well, I think it must have been the the machining of the bore, really. You know. Right, and. Um, not that I, I don't think there was any great inaccuracy anyway in the, I mean, I imagine that was the reason, but it might have been another reason, really. I can't think why, but there, there definitely was A, B and C sizes, you know, and for piston sizes. They were, piston mach they were sizes. machined on the 
crowd at the piston, were they? Well, well, uh, um, well they would clock the bore. Yes, that's right. They, they, they would clock the bore up and then suggest the pistons. And they, get, they gave them to you, really. They gave them to you. And then you fitted them. You know, and that was mm. it. Mm. But why, I, I don't really know. It must have been some slight discrepancy somewhere. But, I mean, it, it was so, you know, everything was so accurate. You, know, you Every stage was done and tested, and you were happy about it. If they signed for it, they were happy about it, and you were happy too, you know. So you'd be building a couple of engines a week? Well, one and a half was about the thing, for, yes. the general thing, for me anyway, really. And um, I did a lot of strip-downs and a lot of... Um, you know, engines that came in, like maybe Anthony Crook's engine, you know, he was racing at the time. Um, he was no, nothing to do with the company at that stage, you know. Yes. His engines would come in on the end of the line, which we objected to because they were often dirty and came off the track and they should never have been in there, not on a production line. Yes. So we didn't agree with that, really, but they were there, no other place to do it, so they, they did them there. And I think, you know, to this day, you know, it should have been purely for production, really. But I think it was a question of space. The laundry was taken over by the, the boys with the racing team, and, and they were involved. So, I mean, there was a little space, you know, there for this sort of thing. And engines would get coming f fast, you know. Horace Gould and Crooks and AC and goodness knows what, really. And I think... My time was then involved with the production engine, you know, really, until they got the contract on May the 15th, I think it was, for Wacky Arnold, for something like 200 engines. Signed the contract, he came down, and um, we were away with that. So then yes. the engines uh, speeded up, the production speeded up. And I, I built many of those, you know, that was um, the BS1 Mark II, I think. How did the BS1 Mark II compare to the standard production engines? Well, I, I think there was a lot of, um, they were glad to see the, sh the, the chassis go in, I think, really, because they were going to have this body put on in, in Italy anyway. It was, it was one of those, um, well, I think it was to do with price, really. In America, you know, they wanted a car that was um, acceptable price-wise. Yes. And I think Wacky Arnold had got the idea of, of through meeting this chap, I, I, think, I can't remember his name, it was Webb or somebody, it was a salesman, met him and introduced him to the Bristol and took him to London to the show and he seen the car and he was away with it. And, and, and that was the two things came together. And it, price-wise, the bowling of Bolide was just right for what the American market, no, f no finesse about it. It was, it was no windscreen wipers or w mirrors and anything like that because he, he was going to sell them the parts to go on the car. But the thing was, he had the car that they wanted and it was attractive because it was um, built on, um, on, a, on a racing design. I, I can't remember which one it was now, but I think, um, you know, the idea was taken off this racing chassis, you know, and it, it, it fitted well, really. It looked good, you know. And the room, I think it sold well, really, and did well. Yes, yes. But, I mean, I, the, I could see the 403 in it, in it, if you know what I mean. The sump, we had a light sump, um, uprated the compression ratio, I think it was, I think it was 9 to 1. And, um, you know, um, a couple of pancake filters on the top, carbs, I think. And yes. um, it was a nice little engine to build, you know, quick, yes, you know. Yes. You didn't have all that huge sump and, and that. And it really was a delightful little engine, really. And of course, it went on to, 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 to win quite a lot of races, you know. Camshaft? Yeah. yeah. Up, upgraded the camshaft yes. a bit, they did. Yes. And I think it was, you know, good. I, I, did, I, I did have a chance to go to America, actually, to, to go around the tracks. But we had a family and I, I turned it down. But um, there was an opportunity there. But, um, what were the Conrods like? Well, I, I think it was all basically the same. They'd gone over to the, the in-line um, structure, hadn't they? After they changed, when they, well, they changed the crankshaft, crankshaft size, like the 403. I think it was two and an eighth, but it was two before. It was a very weak crankshaft. And I think they upped that. And I think they used the same structure within the Arnold, really, you know. Yes. Yes. I thought it was a damn good engine, really. So, so it was mostly VS1 Mark IIs and the 100As that I had anything to do with, really, you know. But 
the engines that came back off test were immediately stripped down on the end of the line by one of my colleagues yes. and the sump came off and the bearings came out and if there was any slight markings in the bearings like you might have got with Swarf you know in the first run up they change all the bearings and yes. put the sump back on yes. and away it goes so there was no question of it tested and, and out like that it was still tested again to make sure that everything was perfectly all right and that was done on the end of the line you know mm -hmm. so I had no part in that but, but um, when it came to you know the, the, the 450 races I'd already worked on the heads with Cliff Freak, so I knew about the six port head. So, so how did he evolve the six port head? How well, did Cliff Freak I, evolve the well, six port well, head? Well, I, I don't think he had anything to do with the design right. of it, really, to be honest with you, because the, the one chap on that picture in the book, uh, I, did, I don't know his name, but I think he was one of the design people, you know, really. Yes. And um, But this head came along with a, you know, well, it was a dream for him, really, because you know, th th it was a re redesigned engine, you know. We, I, when I seen all the parts, like the crankshaft and the, the block with all been shot pinned, which was something I didn't know anything about, you know, what I'd ever done, but, but it, it looked like magic. It, it looked like a show engine. It didn't look like, the, the, like we were building, you yes, know. It was so yes. good. And the crankshaft had been improved. I'd done away with the weights because I mean, the weights had flown off and come out to the side of the engine. And, you know, it was all to do with the, the balance of the, the thing, you know. And um, eventually they got it right. The designers, I suppose, Percy Camish and Ivor, you know, got, got together and they got it sorted out. And it really was a success, you know, in a short time too. I couldn't believe it really. The thing was they went out and won first, second and third and we were delighted with that because, I mean, it was a wonderful effort, really, you know, to think in a short time they'd come up with all that, you know, the redesigning of that engine. Yeah. And they really thought that that first engine was going to work, and it, we, you, you almost knew it wouldn't, because for a start off, um, push rod engines with auxiliaries along the top don't really go into a racing fashion, do they, really? And a chain drive cam, which, you know, they quickly changed, actually. So. In the last lap, the last bit I had to do with it, we, we built one of the 450s up to the stage, um, the head stage, and yes. Percy Kemish came into the shop this day and he said, um, that'll be all. And um, I said, well, I haven't finished, I'm putting the head on. He said, well, that's, that's it, that's, you're out now, because we, we, the timing is something we don't divulge and all that. I, I said, well, I'm disappointed. He said, well, that's it. I said, so we handed the engine over to them and they did the head and the, the timing and they'd gone over to the dry, you know, um, to took the chain drive out and gear drive in with yeah. crankshaft. So I don't know whether that was a good idea, but it worked, you know. Right, so you, you were only allowed to get up to a certain stage with building the 450 engine. Absolutely. And then it was taken away for final yeah, tuning. Yeah. We took it back over the laundry, see? Right. Took it back right. to the laundry. So and that was the racing department over well, in the Well, yeah, it was really. But uh, fair enough, because I seen Mrs. Kemish and Percy in later years and said to them about it. And he said, well, it w we didn't have the facility, did we, over in the in our department, mm. so we had to come across to you because you had it all over there, you know. Yeah, yeah. And um, we we were so worried about the, re the, the rebuilds after the first incident that we wanted it built in the factory, you know. Yes. So that was it, really. But, you know, that was the only bit I had to do with it, you know, and I, I can remember it well. And I, I went to see, as I say, Percy Camish in later years at Portishead, and they showed me all the memorabilia and uh, all about the racing se section and that, and you know, and I, and I, it was a dream really, you know, and it didn't last, did it? Because come to six, 54, and all those people was killed through a stupid action. 80 people killed, and they come back, and that was it. They put them in the laundry, and they never did any more, did mm, they? Mm, mm. Which other individuals did you come across at that time who yeah. were involved in this? Well, I mean. We couldn't have much to do with the racing team because they were never really around. But, you know, the folks like Gildersleeve and Dave you know, Wilkins and all those, we knew them all casually because they were in and out the workshops all mm. the time. They, mm. they always brought their engines in 
and they were taken up the top end and Bernard Tamplin was the one that did most of the racing stuff. He, he, I think he was a, a city footballer or something like that one time, but, but I think for some reason Bernard Tamplin seemed to do all the racing stuff, you know, really. And um, they would take their engines up that department and that would be it, you know, really. I think it was um, just his department, really, you know. He was Dave more, Wil more experienced, you know. I spoke, I spoke to Dave Wilkins the other day. Did he's, you? He's still around. Oh, he's, he's, uh, he's in that picture. Yeah. And I think, I think Dave Wilkins is the one that's on the line in that photo stooping down. Dave Wilkins, mm -hmm. yeah. So what we've got here is we've got a list of uh, May 1952, the engine build production line. Yeah. Uh, we've got the foreman, the inspectors, the builders. Yeah. And we've got the numbers of the engines that you Built. you were you worked on. Yeah. So Ted Connybeer was the foreman. Was that? Yeah. Uh, we've got three inspectors: yeah. Ron, Lear, Ron Lear, yeah, George Pruitt, yeah, yeah, and Jimmy Morris, and Jimmy Morris. Yeah. All aircraft, AID inspectors. Right. So yeah. they come what they come off aircraft and they work Absol to aircraft. They work Absolutely. to aircraft standards. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. How many hours did that add to a job? Do you think to an assembly? Well, not much really. Not much. I, I reckon, you know. It, I reckon it was trivia, really. I, I reckon at the time it was so important that inspection should exist in all these things. Yes. And I don't think it's, I think it's valuable time. These people are qualified to pick up the, the minute things that might be wrong, like, yes. like um, castings that are, um, you know, faulty or something like that, you know, and that was, I learned. And, you know, in, in, in later years, I, I was an inspector for Cam Gears. And I mean, that was my job. I mm. walked around and stopped the whole line. And they, they said, this man is mad. And I said, all the castings are rubbish, take them away. Mm -hmm. and, and this is what I learned from this there. They would walk around and say, that's it, out, stop. So who was on the um, engine build line? There were three of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Our freak, um, myself, and Bill Rose. Yes, yeah. yes. And yeah. You've got, we've got Bernard Tamplin. He was the, he was the racing Spe little spe oh, specialist, really. You know, he was the the one that um, seemed to do all the the engines that came in, really, from the track. You know. Right, right. And then, so engines would be tested. Yeah. And then rebuilt, then reassembled. Yeah. Every engine, or? Well, it just depended. Mostly, they would take the bottom out, you know, yes. and have a look and see if the bearings run, whether the pumps were all right, and and replace them. But you know, so they take they take. It the just depended on what they were prepared to pay, really. Yeah, yes. But I mean, Anthony Crook's engine would come in, and we'd strip all the bearings out of that. And, but rarely would the top come off it. You know, mm. just go back on the track. See, it within same day, probably. You know. Yes. 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 Yeah. Um, who else was around then? You've got. Some... Well, what have we got then? Well, a very important chap. Yeah, there was. A, Bert Owen was the cleaner up and sweeper up and, and fetch and carry man. <laughs> right, right. He had to fetch all this stuff, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the thing was, you know, Fred Reed was the bloke that did all the strip downs after tests on the end of the line. Yes. He lived um, almost next door to Eric Story mm. up in Redland. Yeah. So he was very good. And Mac Manus was the gearbox. Man, yes. Ken Pearson was a suspension tester, right, in the corner of that building in the book, you know. So there was a there was and a that was going all the time. There was the, a rig for testing suspension all, all the time. Yes, it was absolutely crazy, really. Mm. But it was going. Everything was tested to the maximum, you know. Yeah. You know, it it was an exciting, wonderful time, really, and I learned so much about it. I can't can't believe that I would go on in later years to be, you know, a line inspector with about 20, 30 blokes on, you know, mm. and um, feel confident in saying that's enough, you know. Mm. I, wouldn't have, I wouldn't have had that experience if it hadn't have been for that. Yes. So, yes. you know, it, it all added up to that, even though it was a small time, you know, it was a short time in my life, really. Well, we've got the, you, so you worked on the 100A engines from... Yeah. 3,117 yeah. up to 3,162 yeah. uh, 
with that's right not, not all of them but no not the bottom ones because Alfie built one I built yes, one you yes. know uh, and then you the, then did a hundred and hundred and hundred AB yeah yeah three thousand three five one zero yeah then and then, then you did a bunch of BS1 Mark IIs absolutely, yeah. from 202 to 221, yeah. a total of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, six, Wacky seven, Arma was eight, actually eight. up in the office when the, when I'd built the engine. Right. <laughs> and he said, they'd send a contract, yeah, we built the engine, yeah. It was wonderful, really. But, you know, his story is a wonderful story, too, you know. Yes. Yeah, so you built you built ten BS one Mark IIs. Probably more than that. Yes. Was just a few, and yeah, I got others mm -hmm. in books somewhere. Mm -hmm. And the last one was... Um, the 405, when we went to the show in London. Yes. Ter took to, along with a young lad, Terry Davis, and he went along. I think we got him down somewhere. As he he half built an engine somewhere. But yes. Yeah, he went on to spend about 20, 30 years with the, B, uh, the BAC yes. in maintenance. Mm -hmm. But uh, he didn't get in the car department. Mm -hmm. Didn't get in the car department. But you know, we had all the facilities and they hadn't got that now, are they? They didn't have that opportunity. I've been out there and I've seen it, but I mean, they they could never have, well, got the same standard, I don't think. Mm. I don't mm. think they could ever. I mean, I said to Sid Lovesey, where's the engine come from? So he said, America, you know. Mm. Every nut, bolt and screw was made in house. Mm. That was the magic, wasn't it? Mm. I don't think it'll ever be done again. I don't really. I think, I think it truly was, you know, a period when engineering was superior. Yes, yes. Now, who's this in the, who's this in the picture? Well, this one is the one that went and de designed the body, you know. Yes. On, uh, uh, the ERA it was the, the right. framework. So this is the, this is the, the this yeah. is the racing for the, the, for the 450. These are the racing teams which you know had gone from us. You know we only knew them casually. You know this is um, the the boss of it. This is um, Kemish, his wife. Basically Kemish. Ivor yes. uh, Ivor Me, Ivor I think it was. Yes. And, um, this is um, Dave. This is the Charlie Bush. Yes. All the names on the back. I can't remember them, really. but the ones I think is on the line is the one you said, Dave. Dave Wilkins. Wilkins yeah. Yes. The clever man. This one too. Oh, they were all clever, exceptionally clever. Yes. Do you know it was a privilege to work with that lot? It really was. Yes. Yes. It was. Yes. I, I always felt that now. That. You know, in later years, when I thought of. The, the challenges that they had with the bodywork yes. and all that, you know, and, and the structure of the things and coming up with these ideas of, of, uh, of keeping the, the thing on the ground, mm -hmm. really. I think it was magic, really. And then they, so they got Reims and Le Mans, which was very good. In a short time, yes. you know, they did all that, you know. I think we got to admire them. I, I admire everything that's done in Bristol. I think it's done with supreme accuracy, everything, you know, aircraft, the lot, yeah. Did you have m many dealings with Mr. Crook? No. Did you see much of him, or he'd no. been, would he come in? Or? Well, I think he's very flamboyant and all. I mean, he had the sales um, outlet. He was the one that did all the sales, because that, that was it, fair enough. And very flamboyant man, but, I mean, it's be before Mr. Crook came along, I suppose, really, mm. you know. What about famous customers? Did you see any of those? Yes, quite a few came in. You know, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really have known them, but they were film stars and what have you. Mm -hmm. But to say who's seen of Jordan, you know, he um, he came round, and there was there was many stars came around, but there were there was there was very few let in the engine department. They'd shown the bodywork and all that. They wouldn't they wouldn't let him in the. So uh, King, but King Hussein came and saw the engine yeah, department. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he was a nice young bloke actually, and I think uh, you know all, all the troubles they've had and all the years and you know and. You know, so that was so that was when he was in London, was it? He was yeah, studying he came, in London. Well, I think he was studying then, you know, because I think he was in the guards when he was on that and. and um, he was interested in fast cars, and you know he had a, a stable of cars and and that, and um, yeah, he was greatly interested. But it changed overnight, you know. Mm. That was it. Abdullah was shot, and that was it. And I think many of the members of of that family were shot, you know. Mm. But his son now, to this day, is is Abdullah, isn't it? Mm. Uh, yeah, lovely, really. 
wonderful, wonderful time, wonderful period in my life. It's just a highlight in a very short space in my life, you know, really. But it stood me in good stead, you know, especially yes. in the engineering field, you know. Mm -hmm. Delighted, really. And as I said, I, it's a privilege, really, to have worked with people of that calibre, really. Yes, yes. You know, you think you think you you get a feeling that you do know a lot about a subject, and then suddenly you find out you don't know very much about it. <laughs> Does it ever happen to to you? I'm sure that's right. <laughs> I'm sure that's right. We were going to look at the head spanner, weren't we? Yeah, that's right. Tell us about this. Tell us about this little spanner. <laughs> Well, this boomerang spanner, is, I shouldn't really have it, shall I? Because it's not, it's not really mine. It was a factory issue, really. Right. But it was a cylinder head spanner because of the difficulty in fitting the cylinder heads. Mm. You know, um, you could torque so many um, bolts down, but you couldn't complete the fix the head mm. without this spanner. Mm. And it had, you had to learn to use it. It depended on the tension you put on the spanner. When it sprung, you knew that that was it. You didn't go on turning the spanner <laughs> round and round and round like a colleague of mine and wouldn't listen and went on for about an half an hour and stretched all the bolts like that. Right. You, had, you, you did it just right. You did it just right. Yes. And that, but that was about the only thing I think that you did without a torque spanner. Yes. So, um, and you... You just judged the torque on that. Yes. By the way, it, what size is this? A, this Thirteen is, millimeter, I think. Is it? It's, but not, I, it's not Whitworth. No, I thought I thought, thought they changed all the threads over to BSF didn't, and Whitworth, didn't you? But I can't remember which. One. But it's, I'm sure it's, it's thirteen millimeters. I'm sure it's, it's thirteen mil. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, so you you, 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 you just, just judged the torque. Yeah, that's yes. it. I, I I I thought it was a bit crude, but that was a. That was a fact. You couldn't, you couldn't get the torque spanner in there. Mm. But the torque spanners were checked constantly on the line. You know, yes. I mean, all the time the inspection was checking the torque spanner. And it wasn't your job to do it. Would, so, they, would they tighten the cylinder head? How many times would they tighten the cylinder heads down? Well, you know, the type of gasket mattered a yes. great deal. If you had the old type gasket with the copper and the uh, uh, asbestos, you had to pull the head down a couple of times. But right. with an aluminium gasket, mm. or a, uh, just one sheet, I think it was good enough to pull it down, and that was it. Yes. But I, I don't recall him as pulling it down the second time, you know, no, no. which I thought was, you know, unusual. But um, that was it, really. But um, with the alley heads and that, you know, you do have to pull them down evenly. And mm. It's true about that. But this spanner, as I say, <laughs> that, that was all it was, you know, really. So that one's been with you for the last... 60 years. 60, 60 years. years. It's the only thing. I mean, I've thought about it many times, but it was, you know, a high point, really. And I don't honestly think it would have happened if they hadn't formed that racing team. I never mm -hmm. would have had that experience. Mm -hmm. you know? And you probably wouldn't have had the car, would you? <laughs> probably not. Yeah. And that's, we think that's 13 millimetre. I do, yes, I yes. do. I, I'm not even trying to remember that truthfully, but I, I got a feeling it is. Mm -hmm. I'm not too sure, Stefan. What do you think? Because uh, they did, cause they, when they started, when they, they redesigned the engine, they changed all the threads, didn't they? You know, yes. Uh, yes. The BSF and, and I thought wit. But, but this is, would be metric, wouldn't it, if it was 13? Uh, well, well. Only thing I can say, you know, really and truly, the bodywork, which I didn't have anything to do with except mm. I knew all about it, was second to none. But I could never understand the wooden structure, you know, that was going to go into foreign countries with, with different climates. I always yes. thought, I thought that was a, um, uh, something that was in their minds from aircraft days when they were building aircraft with a wooden frame, you know, because they, they, you know, they were very good at press metal mm. and, pre and pressing panels and that. And I think um, they, after the war, they thought, well, wood and, and you know, and, and, me and alley and whatever, you know, would be ideal because they had plenty of it. But, I, you know, I, I think metal was pre preferable to, you know, um, 
wood, didn't you? And well, it didn't work, did it, in Australia? You know what I'm saying? Mm. Mm. I think there was a lot of complaints about, you know, the buckling and the woods under the dashboard and things like that. You know, but um, that's the only thing I felt about that. But I know that the chap who I used to carry home, the inspector, was just absolutely, you know crazy about it. He, he used to walk by a car and, and, and just put his hand over it and reject it, you know. Mm -hmm. Knew instantly that, that, that they had about six coats of paint, you know. Brilliant. But I didn't have anything to do with that, really, except I used to stand there in amazement at the, the finish on the cars, you know. Any trade secrets you remember? Well, Any tricks no, of the trade? There were nothing really, that, that everything was weighed and balanced and mm. we straightened all the push rods and you know, the, the auxiliary rods, and, and as I said, you, you, you always put the pistons in the hot pot and all that, you know. So, what was know. the hot pot? Well, like, you know, to warm your pistons up, you know, and that, mm. that's all, to fit the gudgeon pins and that, you know. Right, right, you'd heat them up. Yeah, that's right. So I'm, yeah. I'm having my two-litre engine rebuilt at the moment. Are you? Are you? Yes. Any special advice for the chap doing it? Well, you know, you sh all, I, all I say is that, you know, it's already precision built in it really the rods you uh, have you got the straight rods in that yes they've been and they've been balanced and they? straight uh, tested yeah, for straightness yeah well, that's all right that's all right well nothing really you know that, uh, is a damper on the front of yours or not there is yes yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a, a good because that the crankshaft used to you know i think it not so much on yours but i think on the earlier ones where the crankshaft was smaller and, it, and, and, and it used to go out of Sink, you mm, know, mm. which had all that trouble with. You know, your crankshaft should be two, two, two eight, I think, the eighth of an inch bigger than, you know, what the, the original was. Right, right, right. Yeah. So I think um, that, that that sorted that one out, you know. Other than that, no, I don't think so. You you ought to find out what's on, what's on the pistons, you know, on on top of pistons, whether there's any numbers on it, A, B, or C, or not, have you? Mm. Well, I've, I've had pistons, some American pistons, which yeah, are forged. Yeah. Um, so they're, 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 they're forged rather than yeah. cast. I don't know what we had. Was they Hepolite, I suppose? They probably were. Yes, Hepolite or Wellworthy. I yeah, Wellworthy or something like that, probably. Yeah. But, you know, it's just... And you know, how did you get the camshaft bearings in? Because that's a tricky... Well, you know, if you just drop them in the fridge overnight, mm. in the ice box, and then tap them in, but make sure that absolutely that you, you got that oil all mm. right, you know, in the... You've only got one chance of that, yes. so you can line it up and tap it in. But if you, I mean, if it's, if they're, they're going easy, you know, and you can you can get them back out, and then reline it. But um, you know, then we had the reamer, which obviously went right the way through. I don't expect don't expect there's many of those around now. The reamer that went right through the front. You've got to be pretty accurate turning that one in, you know. Mm. But I think the clearance was about one and a half there on, on both on both bushes, really. Right. Then there was the camshaft, the, um, the distributor bushes, you know. And there was that um, the distributor sh shaft. You used to have the spaces between. You used to have uh, little shims to put in to keep that, because when it was fixed, the distributor thing, you know, it's, um, it perhaps needed packing in the back, and there was shims to put in there. Yes. So you could always stamp those out. That was the only thing. Then in the sump, I don't know if you've got the big old sump on it, the heavy sump, because it used to have an insert for the plug, you know, yes. the wire insert you screwed in. And then the alley plugs that went into the block, which you know, they would probably never taken those out anyway. And um, apart from that, you know, so we always put the, put, the, uh, put the rods in from the top, you know, and the yes. pistons down, so you didn't try to get the pistons in the bottom, you know, dropped a rod in, and then yes. turn the block over, and if you look at the picture, you'll see the cage where once they put the pistons in and the, the and the bolts, they put the thing on the top and turn the engine over, and then he was away with it. So right. Because right. I, I mean, you used to have a slide years ago, put your pistons in a slide, and then push them in from the bottom, which is very dangerous because you could break a ring and not even know it. Yes, yes. But putting them in from the top, the rods, you know, putting them in gently, you can. You, you wouldn't do any damage. So those are little things, you know, really. But I mean, straightening crankshafts is not a bit <laughs> not going to be in your line, is it? Certainly isn't. No. Well, I've had it. I've had it straightened and balanced. Uh, yeah, yeah. I've had, they 
Yeah. There's some little drillings in one yeah, of them. Yeah, I, th I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think we, they took the damper off when they fit, uh, had the bigger crankshaft, uh, the two and, two and the extra journal size, mm. you know, mm. on the Arnold. I think they took the damper off. Because, mm. I mean, that was the problem, see, was once it got, what they weren't understanding, you could go up to 5,000 revs nicely, really, but when you start doing it on the track, and you're changing gear at a, 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 a hell of a speed, that's not the same as being on a test bed at 5,000 revs, is it? No. And a gradual thing, it might take it at seven. But the thing is, you know, when you're doing a, a, a quick change, then that's when the crankshaft was going haywire, you know. Right. And then bang, right. and out, out come the weights from the side, you know. Right? So we want a good idea, really. In fact, it probably was up to its limits, you know, really, I think. It was. It probably was not designed to go on any further than that. I don't think. Mm. You know. That was as far as they could go. With I the, think that. Yeah. So when I seen it, I thought, well, all those push rods and auxiliaries. Uh, you know, you're not. That's not a racing engine, really. So the four the four fifty engine. Yeah. It, was, was developed bit, as far as they could go. Yeah, you think? It, I think it was. I think it was. I think it was. I think. I think probably the four fifty did. Uh, after they redesigned it, had a bit more. Chance, you know, mm -hmm. but I think the original ones, or the, like the 403, and that was, you know, that was his limit, really, you know, because um, they, well, it proved it, but the crankshaft, you know, they was increasing the size, the bottom end was feeling the strain, wasn't mm -hmm. it, of the, mm -hmm. the whole thing, you know, and um, but I mean, I think the the general thing, the machine in, and that was very accurate. I do really, because I mean the. They were dealing with it like an aircraft, you know. So mm. I don't think there was anything wrong there. But I think, you know, they were asking a lot in a short time, you know. It proved it in the end, didn't it, really, that they, that they had to um, rethink the idea. And I think the, the last going was very good, really. I think the 450 was a good job. Yeah. Thank you very much.